Welcome back to part two of chapter two, the quantum mechanical model. In this part, we're going to look at the Schrodinger equation. You may have heard of his cat um, in relation to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and the quantum mechanical model. We're going to look at properties of the different quantum numbers, the principal quantum number n, angular momentum L, and the magnetic quantum number M sub L. These are going to allow us to look at the different shapes of the orbitals. These are these clouds where you might find these electrons. We no longer look at them as the little orbit around the sun. We now look at them in their three-dimensional shapes. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the more accurately you know where something is, the less you know about how fast it's going because by the time you look at it, it's gone, all right? And so, because we cannot know where it is and how fast it's going at the same time, we can't predict the exact path that it'll follow. The best we can do is we use probability, and probability means that we can find it in a certain area, and that's what we do a, a plot graph for, okay? Um, and so that's how we came up with these different shapes, this probability distribution. So in a classic trajectory, if you're shooting a gun or a bow and arrow or whatever, you're standing in a, in a fixed location. Usually, you know, if you've ever watched them on TV or you've ever done this, they point up. They don't point directly at what they're shooting at. They're going to point up a little bit because they know that it's going to follow this arced trajectory and it's going to come down at a certain location. And if they get that angle right, it's going to hit whatever target they're after. That is a classical trajectory. You have a known start and a known end and you estimate what that arc is going to be so that it will go. The faster something goes, the flatter that is. That's why with um, firearms you can be straight on and it, because it's going fast enough to overcome that arc. But this is a classical trajectory. The quantum mechanical trajectory, we don't know exactly where it is at any one time. Like I can look here, 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 and I can tell exactly at those times where that um, object is. But in this world, I can't know because by the time I know where it is, it's gone. So I can predict an area where I know it's somewhere in there, okay? Somewhere in that overall area. And this distribution gives me this indeterminate quantum mechanical trajectory. So Schrodinger came up with an equation and uh, in Schrodinger's equation he calculated the probability of finding an electron with a certain amount of energy at a certain place and he plotted the distance from the nucleus versus this psi squared, okay, and that represented the orbital. And I actually got to do this way back in the day when I was an undergraduate in organic chemistry. And we used dot printers, dot matrix printers, and it actually did the dots where that electron could be and then came up with this cloud shape. And so it was really cool to see Sorry about that. It was really cool to see um, how this um, came about. And so um, we don't have dot matrix printers anymore, so um, we can't really do it. But um, it, it, it's a real thing. I mean, it's not something that they just made up in their head or anything. I mean, I could physically see. And now if you in your calculators, um, you could actually do some of these plots, and it would actually plot it for you if you have, like, one of those really fancy TI calculators. For us, we're not doing that. We want to just know what do these quantum numbers, what do they tell us, what do they mean, and what can they what can the numbers be? All right? And so there are three prints there are three quantum numbers and then they we added a fourth one 
just because we needed one little additional piece of information to make sure we weren't talking about, about the same electron. So the principal quantum number, we call that N. And it is the energy level and the size. And N is actually the row number on the periodic table. The angular mo quantum num momentum quantum number is L, and that's what type of orbital it is, like if it's S, P, D, or F, you might have heard of those. The magnetic quantum number, M sub L, tells us what orientation it is, what plane is it in, X, Y, or Z. And then finally, the spin quantum number, M sub S, tells us the orientation. Is it spinning clockwise or counterclockwise? Okay, because you can't have the same exact address, if you will, for the same electron. So principal quantum number is the energy. It's always going to be a whole number integer, and it determines the size. And as I said, you can look at your periodic table and see your rows, and the first row is n equals 1, the second row is n equals 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, as you go down the, down the, the uh, rows. The angular momentum quantum number, which is L, tells us what the shape is. And there's four shapes, S, P, D, and F. Okay, if it's an S, its value of L is 0. If it's a P orbital, its value is 1 for L. D's value is 2 for L. And if it has um, an F orbital, it has a value of 3. And these are very, um, when you get past the P orbitals, you get some really interesting shapes for these areas where you could find the electrons. So I'm just going to quickly show you these shapes. Um, just remember, these are three-dimensional, okay? So they are not like some flat circle on a page, and that's what we're trying to show you, the X, Y, Z axis, because this is in three dimensions. Um, this is an S orbital, and this is the lowest energy in the principal energy state, and it is spherical. So S is spherical, and that's nice, and, that, and its L is zero, L equals 1 is your P orbital, and they call these dumbbells. And there's three different dumbbells, one on your x-axis, one on your y-axis, and one on your z-axis. If L equals 2, then it is a d orbital, and there are five d orbitals, and they have like these four lobes, but one of them has this little collar around it called a toroid. So the rest of them are four lobes, but this last one, uh, D sub Z2, is got the little toroid, the little ring around it. And then when you get to the F orbitals, it looks like we're at the circus and they're making balloon animals. Um, each one of these, is this is L equals 3 for an F orbital. Mostly they're eight lobed, okay, so they got a lot of electrons in them. Um, but some have the toroids and, and the um, other things. So these are just um, examples. And they notice they give you the f of x for these. And so if you are a computer or if you're a uh, calculator genius, then you can put that in and see if you can make it um, actually do this. So... I'm going to I'm going to summarize with this and this is this is the most important information for you. The energy levels as we said this is the row of the periodic table. And if you pull your periodic table out and you see H hydrogen that's n equals 1. In n equals 1 you have an s orbital. Okay, that's all you got. Each s orbital can hold two electrons. So you have a total of two electrons. And if n equals 1, we call that 1s. Now, in order to have any electrons in n equals 2, the second row, 
you have to have all of it filled in n equals 1. So you're adding electrons. In n equals 2, you have an s and you can have a p. All right, so you would have a 2s and a 2p, and this is a 1s. Again, you only have two electrons in your s orbital, but remember we have three lobes, or three sets of the dumbbells, I should say, in the p orbital. That allows us to have six, because each one of those orbitals can have two electrons. And since we have three, three times two is six. So there is a total of eight electrons in that level. And that's the maximum it can have. It doesn't have to, because it may not have enough electrons to fill it all the way up, but it could. When you get to n equals three, you can now add a d orbital, s, p, and d. s holds two, p holds three, and since your d orbital has five, it can hold 10 because each one has two electrons, remember. And so 2 plus 6 plus 10, you can have a total of 18 electrons in n equals 3. n equals 4, and this just keeps going, okay? You can have an S, a P, a D, and now you can have an F. And notice how nice these numbers are. You have one S, you have three P's, you can have five D's, and you can have seven F's. So one, three, five, seven. So S, P, D, F, one, three, five, seven. It's a pattern, right? Chemistry has lots of patterns, and if you know the pattern, you don't have to memorize. So we've got two for the S, six for the P, 10 for the D, and 14 for the for the F, so a total of 32 can be in n equals 4. And we're only going to go up to 4 for right now because that's, that's enough, but you need to understand this and know this, okay, so that you know how many electrons go in each orbital, how many of each type of orbital you can have, and where they show up because you only have an S in the first one, then an SP in 2, and then SPD in 3, and then SPDF in 4. So again, that's a pattern. So this is a distribution pattern that if you understand how it works and remember it, then you don't have to memorize because you can say, oh, it's got 7, so it's got 14 electrons. Okay? All right. And so that's your introduction to the wonderful world of the quantum numbers.